Welcome to this video in which I want to talk about sustainable economy and especially bio and CO2 economy. And this video is part of a video series on our successful future. Now, what are the questions that I want to answer? First of all, what are the boundary conditions for a bio-based or a CO2-based economy? And which of these options and among these things also sub-options, so to speak, are possible? First of all, I should mention that I've published a series on publications on that. They all built more or less on the dissertation of Philip Frenzel and they have been published with different people. Well, Philip Frenzel, of course, mostly and other co-authors that participated in that research. If you want to learn something more about the details, especially about exergy to describe um, well, the effects that are going on, that relates actually back to the previous video these exergy considerations and the results of these things are actually then used in this presentation that I'm showing here. Well, exergy. We saw in the exergy movie that we can use exergy to describe processes that are chemical processes that are, that are going on and to describe if they work. We saw that actually chemical exergy is a major contribution to exergy, to the overall exergy and that that should be remaining constant, more or less, across a reaction, if that reaction is technically feasible. As an example, we have seen already, already in the previous video the conversion of glucose by fermentation to ethanol and CO2. So from one component, two different chemicals are being produced. So here you see the different chemicals on the different levels, so to speak. The net reaction change in exergy is shown by this main arrow. So these are the chemical exergies of the two components that are produced. The overall, if you weight that by mass, then you will get this arrow, which is pointing downward a little bit. So that is a favorable, favorable reaction. But there are other reactions that we should think of. So this is apparently something bio-based, which converts that into ethanol, which we can use chemically. And we have actually discussed that emitting the CO2 is detrimental because that leads to a loss of the carbon that we have previously obtained from the biomass, so to speak, to produce the glucose. So as we lose something, we have put some in effort into to gain it in the first place. So we are losing something valuable, actually, so actually we don't like that. Of course, we can reuse that or reactivate that. So we see CO2 is on the lowest level. We have to put some energy in to get something useful out of that. And we can do that via hydrogen, which can, for example, be produced by electrolysis with sustainable electricity. So photovoltaics or whatever producing energy, uh, electricity producing hydro, uh, hydrogen. We can now do a reaction between hydrogen and CO2 that leads to methanol and water. And we see the overall arrow is again almost horizontal, so it is a sufficiently proper chemical reaction that would work. On the other hand side, we can take the ethanol and convert it to ethylene or ethene by stripping off a water molecule. The nice thing about that reaction is now that the ethylene is a so-called direct drop-in to chemical processes. So ethylene is a major feedstock to many chemical processes, so that we can directly feed into existing processes, which is of course very nice. So apparently we see that from glucose via ethanol to ethylene, we can produce from, bio -based, from a bio-based chemical uh, or component, a direct drop-in chemical feedstock that we can feed into our chemical processes. At the same time, we see that from glucose going via ethanol, we lose the CO2, which we can reactivate to methanol by using the hydrogen. And we also see that from the ethanol to the ethylene, we lose the water, so we are again stripping off mass that reduces the mass of our useful product, product the ethylene. So that step is also not optimal because we are losing the mass. So there we see that there are options from something bio-based to something we can directly use, or some things which we have here, ethanol and methanol, which are of course used as feedstock in some chemical um, processes as well but which are currently not the major feed feedstock to chemical industry. If you would like to use these, then significant changes of the processes would be required. So it's possible, presumably, to do many chemicals with that, many good products, polymers, for example, plastics with ethanol and methanol, but that is not the standard where you do it today in, in the big, for the, in the major cases, so to speak. At the same time, I should say that these are just examples to show that it works. If you are a chemist, you know 
hundreds of other options that exist. But these options are nice because they have all arrows which are more or less horizontal, so they work. All of them have been realized at least on pilot plant scale, so it has been shown that they work on a significant scale, not big already, but at least in a, in a smaller scale. Some of them, of course, in big scale as well. Um, so glucose to ethanol, that's a major process going on in Brazil, for example, for bioethanol uh, production. So they work and we know that. Others are possibly equally well. The nice thing about these things is that they structure, so to speak, what we can do in different classes. So if you go from glucose to ethanol, we see we lose something. We can reactivate that. And that, of course, we can take into account in the following consideration. So this structure we want to keep. And of course, you can substitute that with other chemical reactions if you like. The nice thing, as I said here, is the efficiency of these processes is above 90%. So I assume many of them even significantly above 95%. So I assume more or less 100% if I set up the balances and account for the losses by an overall uh, efficiency of the overall process of 85% for all the conversions that may occur from the feedstock to the final product. That may be different in special cases, of course, significantly different sometimes, but that gives at least a certain idea of how the things can go. Now we also need to relate that, so to speak, to the demands and chemicals that we have. For fossil feedstock today, we use 4% of, um, of our foss all of our fossil feedstocks, only 4%, to produce petrochemicals. Small fractions. On the other hand side, we use 2.5% of our fossil feedstock to generate jet fuel which can, of course, also be generated bio-based. And then there is a certain other fraction, which is not really easy to quantify, which will, will be at least of the same order of magnitude as jet fuel, possibly significantly larger, as combustible or material, materially in chemical industry and steel industry. So we somehow use that on some more complex pathways. For steel, for example, we need carbon to put it in there because otherwise it wouldn't be steel. And for other processes, we need chemical processes, we need a so-called reducing atmosphere, which is today realized by burning some of the petrochemicals that are fed to the process, generating that reducing atmosphere, just as an example. And there are several other options where more combustibles are actually required directly physically, so to speak. That means that actually we need to take into account that in the future the petrochemicals can have to be produced from other feedstock than fossil resources. The jet fuel has to be produced from something else than, than fossil resources and that as well. In the scenarios I presented in the video on the competition for land area between foodstuff and biomaterials and bioenergy, the sum of this year was used to be 10% of the primary energy consumption, so to speak. So 2% plus, and I assume that that is 7.5%, but I, work, I mentioned already there, you can have different choices in the diagrams to directly see the consequence of that. This means in turn, if you then, I will in the following focus mostly or only on petrochemicals, but we know actually that we need at least twice that amount that we for the petrochemicals, possibly even more. If we say here 10%, that's two and a half times that on top of that. So three and a half times that value if you want to supply all that, for example, bio-based. Now, if you want to look ahead, so to speak, in time until the end of the uh, sustainable energy transition, until if you want to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade goal, uh, so into the time of 2050. And there we can now do certain calculations and discuss a little bit what are our demands at that time. On the one hand side for the scenarios for the land area, I assumed 440 square meters per capita for biomaterials. That was the value used there for the area that is required in 2050. It decreases over time because agricultural efficiency increases over time, so that's continually increasing to a certain degree. Also, we have to realize the amount that we actually need of the plastics, for example, that we are using in everyday life. And that's not just the plastic bags, that's all the plastics. Yeah, for example, the screen cover here, the frame of that, my clothes, well, I don't wear plastic clothes, but we can use uh, produce textiles from that. My shoes are, of course, plastics, and there are many other things that can be made from plastics that we are using on a daily basis. 
small amounts, sometimes sometimes big amounts, also for buildings. Uh, um, in many things are produced with plastics, for example, the top layer of your kitchen uh, um, table, for example, is possibly plastic. So are many plastic things around. And all that amounts, I assume that we are using 80 kilograms per person and per year. One has to relate that, of course, to today's demands that we have. In developed countries, that value is somewhere around 120 to 150 kilograms per capita and year, 120 to 150. So I assume that on the average we are decreasing that, meaning presumably intensified recycling, which is possible, of course, to be achieved and 80 kilograms appears to be realistic. On the other hand side, less developed countries at the moment use well, it's very variable depending on the countries, some few kilograms, 20, 50 kilograms, something of this order of magnitude per person and year. And of course, if they are developing, if they are living in a better environment, so to speak, more healthy, uh, better standard, standard of living, of course, they will increase their consumption directly which of course means their values will increase and I assume that globally with a more or less well-developed world we will reach somewhere these 80 kilograms meaning compared to a good standard of living an intensified recycling. Now the plastics only are responsible for 75 percent of the chemicals we produce so 25 percent or something else pharmaceuticals, your skin care, ingredients, all these many other things that we use, detergents or whatever. Um, and so if you multiply that by or divide it by the corresponding uh, percentage, then on the one hand side also assume that the overall efficiency of the processes is only 85%, as I assumed previously, as I mentioned previously, then the overall feedstock that is required to produce all these chemicals is 125 kilograms per person and year. So that's the value that we want to use in the following considerations. On the other hand side, for the biocombustibles, I assume, just to mention that, 10% for the 10 of the primary energy consumption as biocombustibles, and for that I use 680 square meters per capita in 2050 in the previous video on the um, area or competition for area between foodstuff and biomaterials and uh, bioenergy. Now, in order to quantify these things, I evaluated the product land area specific productivities for a variety of crops and the major components contained in these crops and evaluated how much land area I actually need to produce that, to supply that. And that's shown in this diagram. So these are the different options that I have for bio-based chemicals in 2050. So the, that's the scale of the productivity, so to speak, increased over, over time with increasing with the current rate of, uh, of increase of efficiency. I have on the one hand side so-called first generation crops, which means they, these components can directly be used as food. So they are direct in competition with food. Then there are second generation um, feedstock, a second uh, generation biomass, which means they compete with food production for the same land area. So they, can, they only grow on, this, on, on similar land area. And then the third generation um, biomass is actually relating to waste products from food production. So it's corn straw and wheat straw as just two examples. I should say I don't mention all options here. I have only selected because of the rest, all of them wouldn't fit on the screen. And then I use actually different options what to do with that. And we can go through that, for example, for the sugar beet as one first generation crop. We can use the sugar, so to speak, and we can do directly sugar chemistry. That means actually using all atoms contained in the sugar and transferring them into the product. We saw in the Exergy movie, the uh, Exergy video, they actually explain that it is beneficial to keep all elements that you have in your feedstock, so to speak, and carry that through until you find it all these also in your products. That's the most efficient way. So do sugar chemistry. That's possible, of course, but that's of course only one option. As I said, these things are only characteristic, so to speak. If you convert the sugar, for example, to a lactic acid, then that is associated only with a very small loss of mass. So it's almost as if you would be using the entire sugar, all the atoms of the sugar, and transfer that into the, your final product, for example, polylactic acid, which is a feasible polymer at the moment, bio-based 
to, uh, to be produced bio-based. Or you can also use the ethanol, where we saw that we actually lose the CO2, but we can re reuse the CO2 by activating it with the hydrogen to form methanol. So we can use the ethanol and the methanol, so to speak, as well from the CO2. We, in both of these cases, we are using all the atoms from the sugar, so to speak, and transfer them into the final product. On the other hand side, we can use only the ethanol, forget about the CO2, which is of course less efficient, or we can convert the ethanol to the ethylene, where we lose water, we are again less efficient. If you want to have the same kilograms in the end of our product, we need more land area to produce that because we lose mass in the chemical step from here to here. Now, of course, I said already, I want to talk about the main things, the big issues, that is plastics to a large degree. Now, any polymer scientist or any plastics producer will tell directly, well, we don't sell polymers by the mass, we sell it by function. That's what you, what you directly hear if you, if you mention that. Now, of course, one has to realize that, well, if you, on the one hand side, the polymers that we will be producing, which are containing apparently more oxygen, that they, of course, they have also very good function. Polycarbonate is one of the strongest polymers that we have, for example. Poly uh, PET, which is used for the plastic bottles, contains also a large fraction of oxygen. That's also one of the most used and very functional polymer that we have, on the one hand side. So there is no contradiction directly. Yeah? On the other hand side, if you sell products, then you can't minimize the mass. If you want to wear something, of course, it has to have a certain mass because if you have only a very thin shirt or so, how does that feel? You couldn't sell that. There has to be a certain mass. Of course, functional shirts, they, are lit, they weigh less. But for example, if you have a chair or a table or so, if you have a chair which is only a thin film, even if it may be strong enough, you wouldn't dare to sit on that. It has to have a certain mass. So actually, the argument that you're only selling function is only partially true. And that's why I'm actually regarding mass. If we use less mass, the better. So that's the, the, the roots that I take, so the feedstock and the products. And then I look especially at this area and let, let's look at a different example where we see some bar here. Let's, for example, that we use corn and produce ethanol from that, which is a process feasible today as well. And there you see a certain bar. On the one hand side, one say, should say, what is the reference? The reference is the available arable land in 2050. This is the entire scale that I show with the high population variant, I should say. So if we develop only to the medium variant, it will be more land area which is available. That's one thing. Then I evaluate, uh, then I mention here in red line, that is the goal, the 440 square meters that I mentioned previously that I used in the simulations with the competition for the land area. So that's the goal, we should at least reach that somehow. And now we have to relate, of course, the land area productivities to that, and that's shown as these bars. They have a certain uncertainty, so that's why they are so big, so there is a certain uncertainty with that. And what I do now actually is I evaluate how much corn I produce on a hectare of land, how much that contains the starch, how much ethanol kind I can produce of that, all with the corresponding stoichiometry and everything. And then I use two different ways for the land area productivity. On the one hand side, the large value is based on the global average land area specific productivity. So I take the global production of corn in that case and in convert that to calories or, 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 or mass, so to speak, for, of, of sugar or ethanol in that case. And on the other hand side, the area on which that is produced and that leads to the global average productivity here. On the other hand side, I evaluate company, uh, countries that produce large fractions of the world production. And then I look at the highest productivities they have. In for corn, that is presumably the United States. Yeah, for wheat, for example, I know there's a similar values for United States, France and Germany. Yeah, and those values I'm using, so to speak, for the lowest value and their highest value is a global average. So this area shows a little bit the variability with respect to climate, soil, and so on. On the other hand side, these are national averages. So this is not an individual field. Some areas can be much more efficient. Others in a country can be less efficient, of course. So since these are averages, that means it's a really realistic values that we can really reach on national level. 
one should say this is the basis for most of these uh, results. For two um, crops that is actually a little bit different, especially miscanthus and wood. So for these bars the basis is a little bit different because there you don't find national average productivities. And so what I did actually, I looked into the literature and took values which propose characteristic values for their productivity. For example, explaining farmers how efficient such things are and what they can earn with that. And from those publications I took the values that I use for that. They may be a little bit optimistic if you take a national average. So they have a higher variability, variability and they can actually, the productivities can be less. That is possibly the land area may be a little bit higher than it's mentioned for these four cases. And now we can look at the different options we have. And there we see, of course, if we look at the three products that we can produce from the same crop, that we have these three land area requirements. We see all of them are below the gold. And you see also there's a different color. Now, what does a different color mean? Green means that has been realized already on large scale. Sugar beet has been produced and converted into sugars on large scale. Sugar conversion to ethanol is done on large scale, so this is green. For the following steps, for example, from ethanol to ethylene, that has not really, really been realized on extremely large scale. That is done on pilot plant scale, it has been shown that it works, so that's only yellow. Use here for, well, sugar chemistry is something, is a special chemical process you can do, but that's not really done on large scale. I mean, polyethylene is not produced that way. Also, the capturing of the CO2 and conversion to measure methanol that's done on the larger pilot plant scale, some 5,000 tons or so per year, but not really on large scale. So that's why that is yellow. So it can work, it can work very well, but it's if, if it's really economically feasible on really large scale, that still has to be tested. The green, they work definitely. The yellow ones, presumably, so with a high probability, uh, actually, uh, so they are contained here as well. And we see, of course, the more we lose our elements, our atoms, so to speak, from our sugar, our original sugar, the more land area we need per producing the same kilograms of final product. So directly using the sugar or the ethanol plus the CO2 for products, winding up in the products is the most efficient process. Stripping off the CO2, emitting that into the atmosphere, releasing that, so to speak, from the process, needs a little bit more land area and converting the ethanol, losing the water to produce the ethylene, again a little bit less mass, means more land area to produce the same mass. We can do the same for sugarcane. I didn't use the ethylene uh, pa pathway anymore. The relations are the same for all of them, more or less. But because this is the least efficient, I didn't account for that. I mean, it it's the, the ratio is almost the same, so it's not new information, more or less. So for sugarcane, again, these two first options, corn to these first options, wheat. And then, of course, we also need to talk about plant oil. Well, oil palms can be used quite efficiently to produce plant oil. There we see that the land area requirement is actually quite small. But of course, we know the problems that exist because that competes with uh, primeval forests. And that is, of course, detrimental. Cutting down those forests to increase the area for palm oil plantations, uh, for, for oil palm, palm plantation, that's of course detrimental for the climate. So we don't want that actually. So that is a question mark behind it, but it, it's feasible. If you just look at that objectively, if we would plant that in different areas, for example, where it grows and doesn't compete with primeval forests, then actually that would be a good option. Rapeseed, on the other hand side, we see that's larger. The, even the most efficient countries are larger than the goal actually, so that is possibly not really an option. I use other oils, uh, sunflower oil, which is also, it's actually, if I remember correctly, worse than the rapeseed, otherwise it would be contained in that, that diagram. So rapeseed, it may work just in, one, in some countries for some products, but not for all the products and uh, not in all countries. Then we see this miscanthus and the wood. Wood means, of course, short, short rotation plantations. So growing the, uh, the trees only for short periods of time, very tightly packed on the land area for say five years or 10 years, something of this order of magnitude, then cutting them down using the biomass. And here I should say I'm also only using um, the cellulose part simply because in many realized processes, the lignin is only used as energy, so to speak, to run the other processes. 
I assume the same. Of course, you can improve that. There are big research uh, projects going on at the moment using the lignin, but using lignin always turns out to be a little bit more difficult, more tricky. And if that will finally work out economically, I don't know. Possibly it does. I don't want to evaluate that actually, but let's stick with the safe side, so to speak, only using the cellulose. And then we see, for example, Miscanthus is performing quite well and also wood would be performing quite well again with a higher uncertainty I mentioned that previously. Then we have the third generation biomass and there we actually see that the green bars, those that definitely work, that are realized today already at least on significantly large scale, there we see actually that they are above that level and actually they are reaching to extremely high values. Now what does that mean? That means we have to consider in this case, this is only for biomaterials. And we saw before that we also need to supply, of course, biocombustibles for jet fuel and other applications. That means actually we need a multiple of that. And that in turn means, of course, that we need extremely large area fractions from which we collect all the wheat straw. So we would have to plant wheat everywhere, more or less, on the almost the entire area, well, world average is here, so almost on the entire uh, arable land, we have to grow that. Well, with crop rotation, of course, that would be a little bit difficult to realize that, so that's even not possible. Uh, and then collect all the straw from everywhere. Corn is a little bit better, but nevertheless, large area fractions, which means, actually, if we want to supply all the feedstock for biomaterials as well, well as biocombustibles from third generation feedstock that simply would not work out. We would have to have straw everywhere, collect it from everywhere and get a little, each little bit from everywhere to, uh, to fulfill our demands. So that doesn't really work out. Which means in turn that actually third generation biomass is not an option to fully supply all the materials and all the biocombustibles that we have. It can be an add-on, but it's only an add-on, it's not the major uh, portion. That means, in turn, we always compete at least with the land area for food production. We can't avoid that if we use biomass. Okay. On the other hand side, one has to say with respect to the straw, there is another very efficient application for the straw, namely keeping it on the land area. Yeah? Digging it under in the, into the land area directly in, in order to cre directly resupply the nutrients contained in that. And on the other hand side, enhance humus formation, which means, of course, in turn, increasing the fertility. And of course, we have to keep our land area fertile because we saw in the competition for land area, for foodstuff and um, bioeconomy, bio we saw actually that we have to enhance our efficiency, the output, the biomass output for our, from our land area at the utmost uh, speed, so to speak, which means we have to keep our land area fertile. So a good idea is always to keep the straw directly in the land area. So there's a competing important application of the straw, I mean, just leaving it there. So that is presumably only of minor importance for the big products. As I said, it can be an add-on for some special applications, but it will not be the big solution. So from that we actually see now many of the greens and the yellow dots are even better in many cases, but there are even green dots or ranges which are possible in many cases. And that means the goals that we set up in the, well, the balance for the land area, that can work out quite well. We always find crops more or less for different climates, for different soil situations that will work in different countries. And so we are well off. Bioeconomy would work in principle. Of course, we have to keep in mind this competition between foodstuff production and the biomaterials production or the biocombustible production. We have to keep that in mind. And on the one of the previous slides where I actually showed the reaction from CO2 to methanol, we have to be aware that, that, is of, that actually that opens a second option that we have. And that relates to the carbon dioxide economy. I didn't work that out in detail because for that we don't need any agri agricultural land area. We can build these plants anywhere that simply collect the CO2 from whatever sources that we have, any point sources, and then convert that into methanol and from that then build the 
the chemicals. It doesn't la need land area, but it needs, needs a lot of energy because we have seen that we have to put in a lot of hydrogen into that, which is produced with energy. So for the bioeconomy, we are actually, of course, also using energy, but that's the sunlight, which is uh, we, that we collect, so to speak, on the agricultural land area by the plants. For the um, CO2 economy, we collect that with photovoltaics or wind energy and then supply it to the, uh, to, the, um, to the chemical, so to speak, to the CO2. The CO2 has to be gathered from the atmosphere, as I said, in, in, well, if we are in a sustainable world, so a decarbonized world, and that is the major source that we have. And that's actually a little bit a problem because many processes have been proposed to realize that, but honestly speaking, personally, I'm a chemical engineer and I, I read the literature. I really don't know if that will be feasible economically. If we don't have to pay for that, and it depends a little bit, of course, on how world population will develop, how scarce land area will be, how the competition between land area and uh, for the different applications will be, if we then have to resort to CO2 to decrease world hunger, or if we can use bioenergy that ha or biomaterials. That has to be turning out somehow in the future. And we can't say the outcome. Problems with the CO2 economy are, for example, that typically large masses are, have to be worked around, pumped around or carried around in order to collect small amounts of CO2. Because typically if you use, for example, absorption for the chemical engineer, so to speak, then the concentration of the CO2 in your liquid, in your absorbent, is small. So you have to work with lots of volume, which means, and also there are um, degradations of your absorbent. So you have to make use make upstreams that cost you something. If that really, really be, be economically feasible, I don't know. Other people have uh, solid absorbents, so solids that collect the CO2 from the atmosphere, but also there the concentration is only of the, of the order of some few percents at most. So you are carrying for one kilogram of CO2, you are carrying around 100 kilograms of other stuff. Yeah, and the question is if that is really economically feasible. Another question is if you employ that on large land area uh, regions, large regions, how does that interact? Because everything, every of these plants has to be supplied with fresh air, fresh CO2 containing air. How is that then really realized on large scale? It's possible, definitely every house like today with a photovoltaic cells possibly has a collector for CO2 on the roof. That can work, of course, sure. We have to see simply how that works out. So that's the second option that we have that competes with that. I should also say, I don't explain that, I mention here the radius that is required for collecting the plants uh, to feed a, um, a plant, a production plant of capacity of final product of 250,000 tons per year, which is a world scale production plant. And there we see that the areas which now take into account the crop rotation that would work out in principle because typically one says the radius has to be less than 50 kilometers in order to be feasible. But we nevertheless have to see what it means because this is the land area that we need if we collect, we only have that land area. So no streets, no forests, no cities. Yeah, then this is the area. If you dilute that with other agricultural activities, with other land area, then of course these radii will increase. But nevertheless, we see that for, for some of the cases, so to speak, the areas are sufficiently small that such a dilution of land area is possible. On the other hand side, what is frequently de discussed is a so-called decentralized production. So you have small plants that collect locally, so to speak, in the surrounding of say 10 or 20 kilometers, whatever is there then produce from that, for example, ethanol, which is then pumped via pipelines or transport by, transported by trucks to the final site, which then only has this big capacity and the local decentralized first step, so to speak. They don't need that large area on the one hand side to be, be fed with sufficient um, feedstock, so possibly only 50,000 tons per year or so, which is of course significantly less, and that would work out definitely as well. So there are options it will work out. Now we can collect that a little bit. We see that we have the bioeconomy as a one option, which is existing technology comparable to food processes, which is actually 
positive, I think, because we can then switch a little bit between foodstuff production and materials production. It's more flexible, more or less. Also, the scale of the processes is increased, which typically is positive for the economy. It, of course, requires agricultural land area, so there is this competition. It cannot, cannot just be third-generation uh, third biomass, we saw that. Energy requirements are comparably small. It, direct drop-ins are possible. And what I did not mention, many of these products actually have a side, as a side product proteins. For example, if you have corn or wheat as your primary product, the sugar, the starch and sugar from that, but there's proteins contained and you can convert them to foodstuff. So there's actually a synergistic effect feeding that back into the food chain, which is quite positive. On the other hand side, it requires often very large site and recycle streams because the nutrients, of course, are contained in all the remainders. So if we use the starch and everything to produce our chemicals or our biocombustibles, the remainders contains the nutrients. They somehow have to get back to the, to the land area. And also, often these processes use large quantities of water. So the concentration actually is somewhere 10, 20 percent or so. And the rest is just water. And that is then has to be fed back in many cases also to the land area, which is a logistical problem. The other option is a CO2 economy. We don't need agricultural land area. We can build that in the desert or wherever. Uh, it requires a lot of energy. The hydrogen has to be pumped in to activate the carbon dioxide to something useful. It's not yet installed on large scale, so the economical feasibility has a question mark. It will work, definitely, but how efficient and how much it will cost, we don't know. It's also possible to build or to generate direct drop-in with, uh, with that. And after net decarbonization, it has to be realized mostly from air. All the other things that are discussed at the moment, so implementing that in fossil power plants to collect the CO2 from that, that can only be of intermediate importance. And the question is, how much do you want to invest in that for some something which only is of intermediate of relevance, where actually the efficiency of the power plant is decreased, energy is has to put in additionally as a, effectively, and the costs are increasing. Don't we better use the money to build up more photovoltaics and more wind energy? Yeah, so an argument that I use. In that case, we can spend every euro on only once. For what do we spend it? Now, after having shown that both of these options exist with different pro and cons, I also want to discuss something about biotechnology because that is very frequently connected with uh, bioeconomy. One has to be say, one has to say very clearly, bioeconomy does not necessarily mean biotechnology. Biotechnology means that we have microbes or microbially produced products like enzymes that actually do the chemical conversions. Unfortunately, these things work typically in lots of water, so very diluted in water, which means on the one hand side that we need large reactor volumes to produce the to get the certain efficiency. They are also often volume specific much less efficient than real chemical reactions where you have a catalyst and everything going on chemically. And thirdly, we often have uh, the case that the products that we produce are actually toxic to the microbes, which means actually we have to ha keep the concentrations low, which means in turn the flow through the equipment has to be fast enough, so the supply of fresh medium has to be fast enough in order to dilute it sufficiently. And that means that we have large volumes of our reactors and large flows through our equipment that we have to, at low concentrations, that we then have to treat with lots of water. And that is highly inefficient. And there are actually only, I would say, a handful, well, more or less handful, uh, reactions that are done with biotechnology that are today done on large scale. Ethanol, citric acid, lactic acid, things like that, they work. But many other things, well, for pharmaceuticals, you have many of these processes, but these are only small products. For the big products, there's only, I think, more or less a handful of uh, fermentations that are realized on a real large scale. To show what it means on the reactor volume, so because the uh, concentration overall is quite diluted, you need large volumes and also the turn, so-called turnover. So how many molecules are converted per time is limited, and that is actually shown here. The productivity of the fermentation in grams per liter an hour per reactor volume in mostly water and an hour. 
is plotted here and the required reactor volume if you want to produce something on that scale, 100,000 tons per year, which is small scale world, uh, world, well, small world scale uh, process. So that's significant already, not gigantic, but significant for production of feedstock for polymers, for example. And there we see sugar to alcohol is somewhere here, 5 grams per liter an hour typically. And there we need reactors of some few thousand cubic meters to produce that tonnage in, of all products. That's feasible. Yeah? Well, how far can it go? We see, well, we see it's feasible. Many products actually, well, some are here in that range, but many are actually significantly lower. And that actually is, a, how should I say, um, a demand that productivity has to get somewhere here, otherwise reactors are getting high. Well, actually, we can get high somewhere to this volume, or you have to use many in parallel, so to speak. That's possible as well. But there exist single reactors of that volume, just to give you an impression, the biggest one of an aerated, aerated, so with air supply, which you need for some of the reactions. The biggest reactor I know, at least, that I've seen personally is this one. It's an aerobic ferment. It's actually a wastewater treatment facility at, uh, in Leverkusen. Um, it has been, this picture has been supplied by Corenta. It's a Bayer Langsas tower technology, te technology for this wastewater treatment. 13,000 cubic meters and a flow rate of 650 cubic meters per hour. So big flow rates, really. These are people down here to give you an impression how big that actually is. Really huge, huge processes and they have four of them in quite uh, in a very small space, so to speak. So you can do it. It works like that. But the other aspect is, and that results, so to speak, from the second consideration, the toxicity of the product to the, to the microbes is that you have to have limiting concentrations, and because uh, you have con uh, limiting concentrations for toxicity, and that defines the flow rates that you have. For sugar to alcohol, you can have 100 grams per liter or even more, which means actually your flow rates for, again, this production rate overall are relatively small. That already poses problems for the bioethanol production. So they all are only feasible for the sugarcane, for example, because the remainders of the sugarcane are, are burned, so to speak. They are firing the distillation to get rid of all the water. And only because of that, this works, so to speak. Many fermentations have a much higher toxicity, so much lower concentrations can reach at most some few grams, which is somewhere over here, some 10 grams possibly here. That's many reactions like that. And then actually you have flow rates which are higher by a factor of roughly 10. It's, yeah, so this is uh, hyperbolic in this logarithmic scaling, so that's really getting big. Big flow rates, which means more water that you have to pump around with very small concentration, and that is simply inefficient, that doesn't work. One also has to realize that actually uh, the, this translates, so to speak, in big processes many pieces of equipment, big pieces of equipment. And one can realize that if one evaluates on Google Maps, for example, for plants, one knows the capacity, how much space do I need for such a plant, which scales a little bit with the equipment. That is the cost also for the equipment. And if one does that, one finds for a typical chemical process, so this is the feedstock and technology, this is the land area required for in square meters per ton per year. So if I have 100 thousand tons per year, I take this value, multiply it with 100,000, and I have the square meters for 100,000 tons per year. Uh, for chemical processes, for example, steam crackers, which are the first feedstock uh, producers, so to speak, in the chemical process, or for other chemical processes, I have evaluated uh, several of them. Uh, there we have typical land area requirements, not too many, so it's not really uh, statistically, it gives just an order of magnitude. We have 0.03, 2.1 square meters per ton per hour. So if we want to have a 100 ton per hour production, for example, uh, ton per year, of course, of 100,000 tons per year, that means 10,000 square meters with this value or 3,000 square meters with that, that value. Somewhere in that range, that production will be. And actually, steam crackers go up to, up to almost 3 million tons per year, and so you get, get see that you have big, really big pieces of equipment. On the other hand side, you can use direct biomass conversion. So, so for example, sugar from starch, which occurs at a high concentrations with high efficiencies, and there you need, nevertheless, 
from biomass more land area as compared to the purely chemical processes. If you then do biochemical processes, for example sugars from alcohol or uh, alcohol from sugars or alcohol from cellulose, which is also investigated in some examples, you get values even bigger. That means, of course, the land area requirements, well, they are not really big compared to the production rates, but the land area is, of course, filled with equipment. That means equipment costs are increasing. That means, of course, biotechnology is not that efficient. So we should try or what will turn out in the end, if you look into the future, it is very likely that, of course, those fermentations, those biotechnological processes that, that work today already, that they will also be in operation, of course, in the future. But possibly not many more others that will at least be relevant on a large scale. And since I want to discuss the big issues, biotechnology is only of limited importance in that picture, only or mostly those fermentations that are really realized already today. Summarizing that, solely third generation bioprocesses is not feasible, we saw that. First and second generation biomass competes for the same land area as food stuff production, which is of course detrimental. Various options are available for feedstock, CO2 from the atmosphere, for example. Um, where we have seen actually that the uh, CO2 utilization needs no land area, which is nice, but needs more energy, and the processes are not really established on large scale. Sugar cane can work, sugar beet, corn, palm oil, with the question marks here. Miscanthus and weeds impossibly would. These, of course, with a little bit question mark with the exact amounts for the land areas, but they will work definitely as well. Uh, would, uh, possibly would, it's only possibly would, because also there the scale of the pilot plants is still not as big as for many of the other processes, so there's also technologically a little bit more question mark behind that. But I'm an engineer, I believe in engineering, so it will work out the efficiency and what of these options then will really work in the end one has to see a little bit. But there are enough options, bio uh, materials and biocombustibles work, it's possible. So bio-based or CO2-based both is possible. Bio-based is preferably either sugar chemistry or co-utilization of the carbon dioxide. So use all atoms that you have in the feedstock. Cellulose components, so this third generation utilization of the straw uh, of the first generation crops that are used for uh, well, biomaterials, biocombustibles or food. Um, that is only an add-on benefit but it also produces large byproducts. Nice for bioeconomy is, of course, also that we can get proteins for food. And we have to foresee a strong interaction between agriculture, food production, chemistry, and energy utilization, energy technologies. So we see actually CO2 is possible, bio-based chemistry is possible, no problem. Both will work with the different pro and cons that I mentioned. We saw collecting everything very condensely, so to speak, both is possible. We have seen bioeconomy is not just only biotechnology. Also, from the discussions on the land area, we have seen that bioeconomy is not automatically sustainable directly. We have to say there is uh, uh, sustainability issues nevertheless. Economics, ecologics and ethics, of course, have to be combined to answer these questions. So there is some um, issue with respect to discussion in, in, in public, so to speak, to uh, really see what is the outcome is that, what can we afford, what is ethics, what, how are the human rights, so to speak, uh, taken into account when going for one or the other option. The big chance is, of course, to get a real circular economy, and I think it's possible from what I've shown. Uh, and it all has to happen within more or less 30 years or it is too late. This means also chemistry, chemical industry has to think how to do these things. And if you keep in mind that building up a process from the lab, so to speak, until it's really realized, it's at least 10 years, that time is quite limited. It doesn't make sense to start only in 20 years with that. We should start, or the chemical industry has to start more or less now, and I know that some, of course, are already going into that quite strongly and working these things out, that they have them available more or less, possibly not realizing them today, but at least know how it works in principle. With that, I would like to say thank you for watching this video, and I hope to see you in one of the other videos.